how's everybody doing? Good. Glad to be back with you guys this week. Woo woo. Thank you, Mackie. Appreciate that, buddy. <laughs> Good to be back. Okay, listen to this. <clears throat> Some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend. Legend became myth. And for two and a half thousand years, the ring passed out of all knowledge. <laughs> Does anybody know what that's from? Okay, so last service, I literally had this whole section over here go, woo <laughs> They were like total cult followers of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Loved it. So if you're not, if you never heard that phrase, it's from Lord of the Rings trilogy from the Fellowship of the Ring. It starts out the movie with that. Uh, if you guys don't know, and like if you haven't, you know, read up on it, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy after writing The Hobbit, uh, did so, uh, he he's, was a Christ follower. So it was definitely from like this biblical point of view. And so if you're not sure about it, if you never watched it, let me just kind of give you a little, a little bit of a history on it. Uh, that phrase that the ring had passed out of all knowledge, uh, it was because there was the evil Lord Sauron, right? He had crafted a ring that was the ring of, not my wedding ring, but the ring of power. <laughs> and this ring of power right, was used to leverage the other 19 rings that were uh, fashioned and made that were given to the leaders of Middle Earth. And so when they put these rings on, he was able to control them and power over them. The ring had an inscription when you heated it up, and on the inside of the ring it said this, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Pretty crazy, huh? Tolkien, what I like about his writing, uh, and maybe some of you don't also know this, that he's also the one who uh, the Lord used to bring C.S. Lewis to faith. So Tolkien actually was a contemporary. They both went to Oxford. He, uh, God had used him to have conversations with C.S. Lewis to bring him to faith. C.S. Lewis, conversely, was the one who, um, who uh, basically convinced him to publish Lord of the Rings because he wasn't going to. <laughs> like crazy, right? Tolkien, what was interesting about him, he didn't use overt religious language in his myths and his stories, but he made this statement about his work. He said the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. Basically, what that means is that his beliefs and what he believed from the Bible infused what he wrote, infused the story of the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings. And that's true for you and I. Our beliefs, what we believe inside gives way to what we think in our words and our actions. But for Tolkien specifically, um, he used myths really to reflect a deeper truth. And one of those truths has been our anchor verse for this series that we've been in, and it's this, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the Lord Sauron, how he poured out his malice and cruelty into the ring. None of you guys watch Lord of the Rings? There's like nobody like into this? Okay, good. Most of you. You're just real quiet. <laughs> you were the late sleepers, right? The first service, it was like they were on coffee or something. <laughs> and so the thief, the enemy of our souls, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I love what Jesus says in the next part of this verse. I have come, right, that they may have life and have it to the full. The life that Jesus is talking about here comes through our understanding and our applying the Word of God. The Word of God, what we call the collection of books in the Bible. The Bible literally just means books, and so it's this collection, the canon of Scripture that we believe is inspired by God. The writings are inspired by God, and so we believe that understanding and applying those to your life will change your life. Jesus said that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if we're not careful, those words of Jesus, the knowledge, well, can be lost. History can become legend. Legend can become myth. And it can pass from out of our understanding. In our own lives, that's true. What God has done in your life, how he's helped you and changed you, if we forget, that history can become legend and then myth. 
That's true in our country. When we allow arguments and disputes to weaken the knowledge of God and how this country was founded. When we allow suffering and hardship and the current realities of what you and I face to become louder than the history of God and how he's worked in us and in our country. When we allow the voices of the present to be louder than the voices of the past. And when we do that, when we allow that to happen, we lose our guiding compass in life. We lose our true north. We lose what God is wanting to do in us, and we lose that the word of God is the absolute truth that can transform us from the inside out. There was a famous saying in the book of Judges that said, in the time of the Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Welcome to 2019. (laughs) But this was true for the Israelites. This is true for the people of God. As you read the stories in the Bible, the people of God were chosen by God, the Israelites. And one of the reasons God chose them as a people was not only because of the the faith of Abraham, but God wanted a people that would shepherd his words, the knowledge. God wants to communicate to us. And he chose the people of God to be the keepers of that word the keepers of that knowledge until the time of Jesus when the word became embodied in flesh. The Bible says the word became flesh in John chapter one and lived among us for a while. And so the keepers of that word, then Jesus was the fulfillment of that. But God had always wanted his word shepherd. And it's why in the book of Deuteronomy, which is one of the first five books of the Bible in the Old Testament, the Shema, and you've heard me talk about this a lot, Deuteronomy 6.4, which talks about how we're to love God and we're to, to remember, remember to impress those ways on our kids. And what happened is the people of Israel had forgotten. They went into the promised land. Moses died, Joshua brought them into the promised land. They came out of Egypt, out of slavery, and over the years they forgot They forgot to tell the stories. They forgot to believe the stories of God. History became legend. Legend became myth. And eventually, from one generation to the next, for hundreds of years, that knowledge completely passed. Which brings us to our narrative this morning. If you have your Bibles or you have a device, you can turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 22. And this is where we find ourselves in this story. 740 years after Moses died and they went into the promised land, they had gone through what was called the period of the judges where God would raise up a prophet or a judge to to rule Israel and to help them. And then they said, no, we want a king. God, we don't want you to be our king. We want a king with flesh and blood. And so God said, fine, gave them a king. And those kings over the years became corrupt and evil and forgot about God. And so after hundreds of years, they went off and were worshiping other idols, sacrificing their kids in the fire. And we come up to this place in the Bible. Pray with me as we get into the word. God, we ask you this morning that as we study this, that you would bring out from this passage some truths for us to take home in our lives. And so God, we ask you to illuminate our minds this morning, to invigorate our souls, and then to ignite our passion to love and know you more. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Chapter 22, verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. How does an eight-year-old become a king? Well, he was in the family line. Josiah's dad, Amon, had a dad whose name was Manasseh. Now, this is important because both of his Both his dad and his grandpa, the Bible says, were wicked and did evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh worshipped other idols. He set up idols in the very temple of God, where God's presence was, where they were to worship the true God. He set up other idols. He sacrificed some of his children in the fire to Baal and to other gods. So he was super wicked. Now, later on, he repented and God restored him for a time, but he had a son, Amon, who also was very wicked, and it says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
So some people who lived in Israel realized that they weren't serving God and they were being cursed and the Assyrians were coming in and trying to take over. They thought, you know what? We're going to get rid of this guy, Amon. So they offed him. They assassinated him. And so at eight years old, Josiah is without a dad and they come to him and say, you're now king. I could just imagine the conversation of these counselors and these, you know, secretary of state and, you know, coming to him and going, hey, buddy, you're king now. You got a good choice ahead of you. How do you want this to play out? Now, it's not in the Bible, but I can imagine there was a conversation. How do you want this to go down? Because at eight, you're not ruling anybody. You're listening to your advisors and counselors. You are king But I can only imagine the thought process and the decision that this young man had to make at a very early age about what he would do and how he would live his life and how he would reign and rule. And we get a glimpse of that in the next verse where it says this. His mother's name was Jedadiah, daughter of Adai, and she was from Boscath. Now let's all say those names together. No, let's not. He did what was right, right here, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways, now they say, of his father David. King David was kind of the standard of how a godly person should be towards God. Now, we know his history. There was issues King David had as well. But God saw his heart. In fact, when he was chosen to be king, Samuel, the prophet, went to David and said, man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And David had a heart that loved God. And so they're making this analogy here that he followed like the ways of his father, the the ultimate king, the standard, David. And it says this, not turning aside to the right or the left. In other words, he valued godly instruction and was moving forward. Verse 3, in the 18th year of his reign, how how old does that make him? Awesome. we got some math majors in here. 18 years. So he's 26. So some time has gone by from when we first have this story. It says King Josiah sent the secretary. So it's like a secretary of state. Shaphan, the son of Azaliah. So that was like kind of his number two guy. He sends him to the temple of the Lord. In verse 4, he says, Now go to Hilkiah, that's the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected, and have them entrusted to men and appointed to supervise the work of the temple. So basically, they're getting ready to do a renovation project. Josiah realizes that they have neglected the temple of God, and it was a mess. And so he's saying, look, I need to send you guys and go get all the materials, give them the money, let's fix this place. And so that's what happens. Now skip down to verse 8. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. Now when reading this passage, it's super easy just to skip right over that. But during the reno project, during the renovation, they find what's called the book of the law. This book, which would have been, most scholars believe, the book of Deuteronomy, and it wasn't a book, it was a scroll. It would have been on parchment paper. They find it. For hundreds of years, this book had been lost. This was the commands of God through Moses to the people on the blessings and cursings and how they were to live their life. Like this was like the deal and they had lost it. And during this renovation project, they find it for the first time in years. So this is like a big deal right now. Now Hilkiah, the high priest, He gives it to Shaphan, the secretary, who reads it. Then he goes to the king and says, Hey, your officials have put out the money that was in the temple of the Lord, entrusted it to the workers and supervisors. And then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And then he reads it in the presence of the king. In verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law. So remember, this is the first time this guy ever hears the actual words. All his life, from being eight years old as king up until 26, all he's ever had is advisors and people maybe telling him different parts of the law, stories about the exodus. So he's never actually heard it. This is the first time he hears the word of God. And it says here, he tore his robes. You picture the king in all of his garments and all dressed up, and he hears it, and he stands up and tears his robes. 
he's freaking out because he realizes what he's hearing that they have completely gone off track and he's cut to the heart. When someone would tear their robes in ancient times, it was a sign of just anguish and repentance and being cut to the heart. And he's like, (gasps) when he hears this, verse 12, he then immediately gives orders to Hilkiah the priest and to a bunch of other guys that I'm not going to go through all their names. Verse 13, he says, go guys, I need you to go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book and they have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. There's a transformation happening in Josiah's heart right now when he hears the word of God. And the same is true for you and I. When we choose to really hear the word of God in our lives, transformation begins to happen within us. The word of God is powerful. And there's something about the hearing of it, but then the joining of our hearts and minds and believing that transformation happens. And that's what's going on right now in Josiah's heart. He sees that and he's realizing something's something's gotta happen. You see, transformational change always begins in the heart. It always begins in our heart. It has to go for the inside. And that's where God starts. It's why the warning in Proverbs is this. He says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Now, am I talking about this big pumping organ with blood? No. What we're talking about at the heart is where you and I live out of. We live at the core of our being out of our heart. Your human spirit, my human spirit is formed through the experiences and the choices that we make and that we have made in the past. It informs our present and the future, and it's simply a result for you and I that we then live out of the depths of our being when we do that. We live out of that depth. That's our spirit or our will or our heart is what the Bible calls. It's from that place that we see the world and that we interpret the world around us. It's from there we make our choices in life, how we move into action, how we want to change the world. All of that is living from the depths of who you are, your heart. So the question this morning is, how do you and I begin to take steps towards transformation in our life and letting our hearts be changed? Because that's where it starts. Josiah sees this. And so we're going to talk about three things in the heart this morning. Having a humble heart, an obedient heart, and a responsive heart to God. And so make this year a year of growing in humility. Having a heart that's humble. When Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, look what it says he did. He tore his robes. There was a a humility about him when he realized his life and the the life of those of his countrymen and how far they had moved away from God. He realized that he had to humble himself before God and say, wow, we're not anywhere near what you want for our lives, God. And so transformational change begins in him. And transformational change never just ends with you. It, when you allow God to change your life, it'll change your family. It'll change your people around you, your neighborhood, your workplace. It never just stays within. That's why it's always a myth when people say, oh, you know, it's my sin. What I do doesn't hurt anyone else. <laughs> That's a myth, by the way. Because the converse is true. When we change for the good, when God transforms us, it changes everyone around you. And the same if we choose evil. Both of those are true. I think a good thing we can do as parents is model humility to our kids. And that's hard to do sometimes. And being able to say to our kids, you know what? The other night when I got mad and, you know, talked unkind to you, will you please forgive me for that? I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? You guys try that sometime. It's like, right? I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? I know it's hard to get out. <laughs> but it's awesome to do that, to model that. Because we're, the thing with humility is we don't just like wake up humble. We, and you can't think your way into humility. I can't think my way into humility. It's something I have to practice. It's something that I have to, you know, set out to do. You grow into humility. 
Interesting statement. This is James, the brother of, half-brother of Jesus, made this statement in the book he wrote. He said, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Shows favor to the humble. There's an interesting thing where God says in the New Testament, he says, humble yourself, humble yourself. And there's always this choice that you and I have. I can humble myself, or what's the, what's the other choice? Get humbled. Thank you. This has happened to you before. <laughs> right? That's always the two choices. If you are here and you've begun your relationship with Jesus and you said, look, you know, you've, you've, settled, uh, you've settled the question, this question here of who's in authority over my life, then God's after something. He's after transforming our hearts. And so we have the choice of humbling ourselves or being humbled. Now, I've been through both of these. I'll tell you which one I prefer. I prefer like humbling myself because I really don't like it when I get humbled, <laughs> right? It's tough. But he's saying, look, I want to give you favor. When you humble yourselves, God, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor when we humble ourselves. And to do that, we have to settle that question. Who's the boss applesauce? <laughs> right? I know you guys tell your kids that. <laughs> Who's the boss applesauce? <laughs> like, we have to settle that question. Who's in charge? Well, God is. And Josiah, I love what they say about him. He did what was right in whose eyes? His own? No, in God's eyes. He did what was right in the Lord's eyes. He decided to approach God with humility and knowing and recognizing that he's in charge. And again, he could have made excuses. Like, what do you mean? I got this kingship when I was eight. This is my fault you all messed all this up. He could have blamed his family of origins. He could have been a victim. But he chose not to do that. He chose to take responsibility and say, you know what, this is on me. This is on my choices now. Regardless of what my parents did, my grandparents did, what my friends did, this is on me now. And that's important, to walk in humility to know this is on me now. And he chose to do the right thing. He accepted God's word, he accepted his truth, and then he realizes that God's instructions are not suggestions. I mean, you think about it, Moses, right? God calls him up to the mountain. He says, bring two tablets. Moses is chugging up the hill. God, like, writes the Ten Commandments with his fingers. And at the end, he says, hey, dude, these are really ten suggestions for successful living. No, they're commandments. And if you're like me, I do not like the word command. You ain't going to command me to do nothing, <laughs> right? Who likes the word command? Like, nobody does. It's definitely not our culture to like the word command. I like suggestions, but that's not what this is. Because here's the thing. God created you and I, right? He knows how we tick. He knows how we are. He knows our personality. And by the way, he loves us despite any other quirks or sins or anything. He loves you like nobody's business. He loves you. And he knows, he's omniscient. He knows your future. Like he knows all about us. So he's like, hey, here's what I need you to do to be successful at life, a godly life. You need to obey my commands. And there's where it hits. This is the, this is the age-old question of what we call lordship. Who's in charge, me or God? And this is a hard thing that we have to settle in our hearts. Coming to faith is a faith where we humble ourselves before God's hand. I love what Josiah does in this passage. He goes and inquires of the Lord, and he's telling them to do this. Because he not only hears this word and he realizes, man, I haven't heard the word of God. And so now he's like, I need to know more. I need to hear what God thinks about my life. What is it he wants me to do? How does he want me to live? So he's in that moment like, I need, I need to hear more, God. There's this humbleness about him to find out more, to dig in, to learn about what God is wanting to say to him. And that's true for you and I 
To have a humble heart means you want to know what does God think about your life? What is God's plan? What is his will for your life? What does he have to say about what it is the decisions that you want to make? It's not like Jesus is my co-pilot. He is the pilot. <laughs> you know, that bumper sticker, I used to always get a crack out of that. God is my co-pilot. And then some people changed it and said, dog is my co-pilot. Uh, but like, seriously, God's not the co-pilot. When you've made him the Lord of your life, he's in charge. And so what is the strategy for you and I? That's to me the question. How, what is the strategy for getting closer to hear the words of God in your life, to hearing what God wants for you? And I think the simplest, most basic is the word of God, reading the Bible, reading the collection of books that we call the inspired word of God to know what he has to say about my life and your life to know what it is that he's wanting to help us with. Being a disciple literally means learner. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, go and make disciples of everyone. What he meant was go and make learners because the word disciple is really the word learn. If it was in today's vernacular, he wouldn't say disciple. So some of you, I know that's messing with you. That's like a spiritual word to you. Disciple. It just means Learner. Go teach them everything I've taught you. Let them be learners, and then they go do it and go change the world. That's just the simple missional mandate that Jesus gave all of his followers. And so we're called to learn. We're called to be intentional, to have a strategy, to know what it is that God wants for your life and how he wants you to live that life out. He wants to reveal that to you and to me. He wants us to be committed to learning. And so that question is, are you willing to learn from God, but also are you learn, willing to learn from others? Again, this takes a humble heart to learn from others. I learn from all kinds of people. I learn from people who run really big churches in America. I'm in a consortium where I meet with other executive pastors all over the nation. How do you guys reach people for Jesus? What do you do to disciple people? Like, how do you do this? I learn from people who are at smaller churches. I learn from guys who are older than me. I learn from people who are younger than me. I love learning from my enemies. Here's what's cool about learning from your enemies and people that disagree with you is that if I learn from somebody who doesn't like me or who's my enemy, I know everything that I know and then I learn from them about whatever it is we're fighting about. So now I know what I know and what they know so I know more than they do. <laughs> Does that sound humble? Okay. <laughs> but the reality is like being willing to learn from anybody. I love what Rick Warren said. He said, the impact on your life will uh, largely be from the people you meet and the books you read. So however your learning style is, whether it's reading or auto, audio books or whatever, it's the idea of going after more information that God wants to help you and I to learn. We're called to be learners. We're called to be disciples. And so it's taking that time and being intentional to do that. There's three books I'm currently reading right now. One is called Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. Just an amazing theologian. He passed away, I think, a couple of years ago. I'm also reading this other book that's not a Christian book, but it's amazing. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And then A Long Obedience in the Same Direction by Eugene Peterson. There are a ton of resources out there to help you and I grow in our faith. Here's three books that are on my list of what I want to learn and read this year. I would encourage you guys, you can get these books, by the way, through our Right Now Media account. So New Break Church gives away for free to anyone who attends access to Right Now Media. So at the end of the service, you can go out to the Black Tent, give them your email, we'll give you an access code, and you have tens of thousands of books and videos at your disposal on growing in the Christian walk for free. We don't ask for anything, it's yours. We believe in discipleship. We believe in families. There's all kinds of things that you and I can do to access. And these are just some of the you know, books that I, I really think are going to be amazing and helpful. One of them is Whisper, which is by Mark Batterson, which is how to hear the voice of God. The other one is Discovering God's Will in Your Life by Andy Stanley. The third one, Sacred Pathways, uh, which helps you find this path. What is your path to God? Uh, just some ideas, right? Practical on how you and I can learn more and be committed to learning and it requires us to have a teachable spirit so having a humble heart having that humility inside leads you and i then to what we call an obedient heart and that takes practice that takes practice josiah when he hears the book of the law he gives these orders right away so 
He hears and he obeys immediately. He's quick to act. The key word is practicing, though, for you and I, because nobody just leans into obedience perfectly. You know, we have to ask God to change our desires, to change our heart. Things that God asks us to do when we are struggling, like, say, with patience, and we know we're supposed to be patient people, right? Here's how we do it. God gives us a command, or we know we read something in the Bible, and we know we're supposed to be a certain way, and so we're like, okay, I need to be patient, but we, we argue, right? But you don't know my husband. <laughs> or, you know, God's asking you to have a clean moral life and to not lust, and you're like, but have you been to San Diego Beach? So we argue, right? I know for me, I'm learning to be not so competitive and kind when I play board games with my wife and friends that come over. <sighs> have you ever played Machi Koro? Anybody play Machi Koro? This thing is addictive to all get out. I don't know what happens, but I got these horns that sprout out of my head and this tail that comes out. It's like I get so competitive. And we were playing the other night with friends, and uh, my wife had lost all the games all night. And then this last game... I was like one roll away from winning, and then I did the wrong move, but she hadn't rolled yet. So I was like, wait, hold it. I'm going to redo it. It redid it, rolled. I win. She's like, really? Because she just won. She would have just won. And she looks at me, and I'm like, oh, you're an idiot. (laughs) Competitive. I need to be kind. But here's the thing. When it comes to these things that God is asking us to obey, And I'm going to read this statement to you, and I hate it. I hate this statement. I don't know how it ended up in my notes. My spiritual, your spiritual maturity is gauged by the time it takes between when I hear God and how long it takes me to obey. I'm going to read that one more time. My spiritual maturity is gauged by when I hear God and how long it takes me to obey him. I don't like that because I would much rather go, oh, no, my spirituality should be measured, my maturity, by how much I pray and, you know, read the Bible. And No, <laughs> it's how it works itself out in obedience. Like, that's a tough one. Because I know me. You know you. You know there's things that God's been talking to you for years, decades. <laughs> right? Now, it's not a guilt thing. That's why God loves us and there's grace, but he's wanting us to get there. He's wanting us to bridge that gap. He's wanting us to have an obedient heart. Now, how many in here are rule followers? Raise your hand. Rule follower, raise your hand. See, you're obedient. You're raise your hand. You're a rule follower. You wouldn't have raised your hand if you weren't a rule follower. Gotcha. So there's rule followers and then there's the rest of us. The creative free spirits. All y'all raise your hand. Don't, no, don't raise your hand. No. All y'all, right? The creative free spirits. So those are kind of personality driven, right? They're personality driven. And so for a lot of us, that personality, some of us naturally obey better. Some of us just, we're a little different. But either way, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to practice obedience, how to practice listening to God, listening to his word, and then responding quickly to him. You see, we have to follow God with focus. Josiah didn't turn to the right or the left. And there's always going to be distractions for you and I from following God's ways and his will, from hearing his words and following them. And it's putting those distractions aside and being committed to building momentum one step at a time. What am I talking about? We are in Kings, but Chronicles, the book of Chronicles, tells the same story of Josiah, and it adds these extra bits of information about his life. It says, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. How old does that make him? 16. So at the age of 16, he became king at eight, but at the age of 16, he made a decision that he was going to begin to seek God. So whether you're a student here or you're older, it doesn't matter. But for him, like he started young and there's a power to following God at a young age. It, it changed the rest of his trajectory of his kingship and what he did. 
There's a power to serving God when you are younger and making that decision. At 20, in his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of all the idols that had been there. And then as we read earlier in the 18th year, he begins this renovation of the temple of God. But he's practicing this godliness, this obedience, one step at a time throughout his life. As, as the markers of the years of his life goes on, he makes a decision to not let it slip, to not forget for a few years, but to go after God and to keep going after God. There's a power to that. I tell people sometimes when they hear my story of just the train wreck that it was when I was younger, they're like, oh, but you got so many great stories. <laughs> awesome. I would much, tra much rather trade that to have begun my relationship at eight and never have fallen. And, and for me, that story would be of God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness instead of this whole deliverance story that I have to tell all the time. They're both awesome, don't get me wrong. God's amazing. He's so kind and gracious. But there's a power to like serving God and to not give in. How does a 26-year-old make such a revolutionary change? Well, it's what we call the power of 1%. And I want to explain that to you with a story. It's the power of 1%, and this is in James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, that I'm reading. He talks about the British cycling team, cycling team that uh, uh, was put together, and how one day they made a decision that changed the whole trajectory of their cycling team uh, that had never happened before, and that was this. When they hired this guy, Dave Brailsford, uh, he was the new performance director. They had, for 100 years, only won one gold medal in cycling. For 100 years. For 110 years, they'd never won the Tour de France. In fact, they were so mediocre and bad that the companies, the British bike companies, wouldn't, didn't want them riding their bikes because it would make it look bad for them and they would lose sales on their bikes. They're like, yeah, can you guys please not ride our bikes? And so this guy steps in and what he does is he begins to make this change where he takes a tiny margin of improvement in one area. He says it this way. He says, the whole principle comes from the idea that if you break down everything you can think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by 1%, you'll get a significant increase when you put them all together. So small adjustments like the seat, making it a little more comfortable to ride long distance. He did heated overpants so that their muscle temperature during training would feel better. He did uh, biometric sensors when they would train to, you know, kind of track where they're at. Then he did these other little things like massage gels. After training, having the right massage gel so that their uh, muscles, you know, they would uh, heal back after a hard training session and they'd reinvigorate their muscles. Uh, they brought a doctor in to teach them how to wash their hands. Why? Because they were getting colds and getting sick and not able to chain, uh, train. Uh, they looked at their pillows and mattresses so they could have the ultimate sleep experience every night. So he just changed all these little micro pieces. Now, here's what happened, okay? 100 years, only one medal. Never won the Tour de France. So after he took over in the 2008 Olympic Games they won, in Beijing, they won an astounding 60% of all gold medals in the cycling area. Four years later, when the Olympics came to London, the Brits set nine Olympic records and seven world records. And that same year, Bradley Wiggins became the first British cyclist to win the Tour de France. The next year, his teammate, Chris Frome, won the race. He would go on to win the 2015, 2016, 2017 Tour de France. And then his teammate, Thomas, in last year won the Tour de France. So that's six out of seven years. So you think about that. How does that happen? How does it go from complete mediocrity to where they were at? How do small improvements accumulate into such remarkable results? And it's this. Small habits make a big difference. Small habits make a big difference. What does that mean for us today? What, what are you talking about, Pastor? That was a cool story on cycling. <laughs> it's the same for us. When we obey... When we take the time to follow God and we do it in the smallest of areas. Because sometimes God may call you to do something that's really big, step out in faith. But if I haven't been faithful, if I haven't been obedient in the small things, I'm never going to take that big step. I'm never going to step into everything God has for me because 
I haven't learned obedience in the very small things. And so when you look at some of this and you think about your own walk with Jesus, start small. Hey, wake up early and read the Bible. Yes, God. <laughs> hey, pray just 10 minutes. Yes, God. <laughs> right? Just some micro adjustments. Because what you're going to find out is it's the snowball effect. It's going to just, your life is going to become aligned with the will of God. And what happens is, you know, and it's not perfect, okay? We don't, nobody does anything perfect. <laughs> but you're going to find that over the long haul, which I love Eugene Peterson's book, this one here, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. <laughs> not a short obedience in many directions. A long obedience in the same direction. What I love about it is it's that idea that as we follow God, our lives, there seems to be like, I want to say it's not automation, but you find yourselves in a way to say yes to God so much more fluid and easier. And it becomes less of this fight with the will of God in your life. Just to take a deep breath. Yes, God. Yes, God. That's the power of 1%. That's the power of small habits that make a big difference. It's doing what, I need, doing what I know I need to do when I need to do it, not waiting till I have it all figured out, but following God. So it's having a humble heart and an obedient heart in this last piece as we close. It's having a responsive heart. We go back to our story and with uh, Josiah when he sends all of his people to go hear from God. He sends them to a priest, or sorry, a prophet, and it's a woman prophet he sends them to. And they say, hey, what does God have to say about all this? And I'll just summarize it for you in this passage. The prophet says, yeah, God said in his word, there's disaster. You have disobeyed me. The whole country has. I'm going to bring this disaster on all of y'all. And then she said, tell the king this, though. Because he had a responsive heart and he humbled himself and he obeyed. Tell the king he won't see any of this in his lifetime. So God like totally hears him. God sees his, his heart. God sees that he obeyed. Like God then moves on his behalf and says, yeah, you're not, don't worry. Yeah, I did say this was all gonna happen, but you know what, I'm gonna hold back. I mean, that's a gnarly story. I get it, right? But it's like weird how God's like, no, not weird. It's just how he's moved. It's how God has wired us and so the amazing thing happens to the king, and they take this answer back to the king. See, a, resp a responsive heart is always open to the ways of God. At the end of this story, the narrator, person narrating this in 2 Kings says this, Neither before nor after Josiah was there ever a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength. What a great epitaph to have like written on your tombstone. <laughs> followed God. See, God's looking throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's what he's after. I'm going to call up the worship team right now. We're going to end our time together. And I want to ask this question. What is the state of my heart today? Does my heart break for the things that break the heart of God? Does my heart go after the things that the heart of God wants to see in our world? Do I pursue those things that matter to him? It's really the question. Because all of this being humble, obedient, all this is not just for us internally to be pious or, you know, holy. It's so that it works its way out. Yes, God wants to transform us from the inside, but it works its way out into action into our world. And it starts with really the prayer where God says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. To me, that's the prayer. That's the prayer I want to pray every day. And some of you need to pray that prayer this morning. And so we're going to close our time in prayer and then the worship team's going to just lead us in a song. Make that your prayer this morning. Ask God for a, a heart of flesh, a heart that's responsive to him 
Sometimes we run and we run and we run and we run, and it just, quite frankly, gets exhausting running from God. Sometimes he wants us just to stop, put our hands up and say, okay, God, have your way. So that's what I want to pray about. Join with me in prayer. Close your eyes, please.